Hello! Welcome to Variables, Operational Definitions, and Measurement Levels. Let's begin with variables, and we'll start with the definition. We can define variable as an entity that can assume different values, and some examples might be helpful here. Many people who are interested in psychology are interested in different therapies, so let's think about therapy as a variable. Well, again, our definition is an entity that can assume different values, so some different values that the variable of therapy might assume could be something like group therapy. That would be one level of the therapy variable. Another level might be medication. A third level of that variable might be cognitive behavioral therapy. So we have therapy as a variable. You can think of it kind of as a container that holds different subcontainers. These are the levels of that variable. Okay, let's move on to dependent variable. This is what we measure, and we often use dependent variable synonymously with the idea of an outcome variable. So dependent variable and outcome variable mean the same thing. It's what we measure, as you might recall from junior high school or high school science classes. Let's take some examples of dependent variables that psychologists would typically be interested in. So some examples might include the ability to solve a problem. That's something that a psychologist could measure. The ability to get along with other people, or if we're looking at other species, we might say the ability to get along with conspecifics. That's members of that organism's species. That might be something that we measure. That would be a dependent variable, also an outcome variable. Another dependent variable might be something like the extent to which someone is conscientious. These are all possible dependent variables that might be of interest to psychologists. We can contrast dependent variables with independent variables, the variable whose effect we seek to know. And often it's the case that the independent variable is that which is being manipulated by an experimenter in an experiment. Okay, so let's move on to operational definitions. Now that we have variables, we'll need to define the variables, and we typically do so in science, and especially in psychology, operationally. So let's see if we can understand what we mean by an operational definition, as opposed to some other kind of definition. An operational definition is a statement that specifies the procedures used to measure a variable. And I have here, parenthetically, the operations, so that you can see where this word operational definition comes from. But if I use the word operations right over here, and I probably could, you would fairly accuse me of having a circular definition, that is, using the word operations as part of the definition for operational definition, <laughs> and that would not be appropriate. For those who are interested, there's a wiki that further elaborates on operational definitions. You might want to click on this link and take a look at that information. To help us develop better intuitions about operational definitions, it's a good idea to get some practice. And I'll ask you in just a moment to stop the video and attempt to come up with an operational definition for each of these terms, which we would frequently encounter in psychology. That is, you can stop the video and create an operational definition for depression, and for physical attractiveness, and for intelligence. Go ahead and stop the video now. Okay, welcome back. So one question that we can ask is whether your operational definition for intelligence might be relevant to this picture. This is a picture from Wiki, and in it you can see we have a chimpanzee who is using a stick as a tool. So it's interesting to muse about whether the operational definition that you just created for intelligence would capture this particular behavior. Many people would agree that the chimpanzee in this picture is demonstrating some kind of intelligent behavior, we can ask whether your particular operational definition of intelligence captures this or whether it doesn't. And if it doesn't, that's okay, but it points out a limitation with operational definitions. That's something that we should be aware about if we are going to be cautious scientists. Okay, let's move from operational definition to our final topic for today, which is levels of measurement. And we're going to introduce four different levels of measurement. The first of which is the nominal scale, also called the categorical scale. And this is the least precise of the four different scales that we'll be looking at. We'll give some examples here that might help motivate our understanding of this particular level of measurement. So let's assume that we are cultural psychologists, and we're interested in how behaviors, thoughts, or feelings might change across different cultures. And we might go and make different investigations in a French culture, a Chinese culture, a Nigerian culture, and a Brazilian culture. 
Those are four different categories of culture. Notice that they are qualitatively different from each other, and that is the case for nominal variables, when we're measuring something on a nominal scale. They're qualitatively different. We would not say that one of those is greater or less than. All we can say, then, is that they are not equal to each other. Okay? And not equal means that they're just qualitatively different. It doesn't mean that they're deserving of more or less rights. It only means that they're relevantly different in some important way for our investigation. So the not equals sign would be the only kind of arithmetic sign that we could use. We could use a different arithmetic sign, though, if we move up to the ordinal or rank scale. Here, we'll start out with some examples. Some educational psychologists might be interested in the idea that different colleges can be ranked differently from each other. One particular college might be ranked first, another college might be ranked ninth, another one might be ranked 27th, and so forth. Now we can begin to say, unlike the nominal case, that some of those schools really are ranked more favorably than others, and we can now invoke a different kind of arithmetic symbol. We can now here use a greater than or less than sign. We can say that one rank is greater than another one. Okay? Interestingly, if we're looking at the difference between the first rank school and the second rank school and the third rank school, it might be that the interval between those ranks is very uneven. First and second place might be very close to each other. There might be a huge gap, and then we have the third place school followed by the fourth place school, and then another huge gap between the fourth and fifth school, and so forth. The intervals in an ordinal scale are often very unequal. So this brings us to our next scale, which is called the interval scale. And this scale is characterized by having equal intervals or equal spaces between the values on that scale, unlike the ordinal scale. And there are ways of thinking about this, too. For example, we can think about a health psychologist that might be interested in keeping people within a healthy weight range. And they can talk about gaining three pounds or five pounds, or losing three pounds or five pounds. If we think about the interval between three and five pounds, that interval is a two-pound interval. And that's the same interval as between five and seven pounds. And that's the same interval as between 104 pounds and 106 pounds. All of those intervals are the same. They happen to be two pounds. In this case, an interesting feature that arises is that we can begin comparing the values on an interval scale by using now a new arithmetic operation. We can use addition and subtraction because we have equal intervals. Unlike here, in the ordinal case, where all we can say is greater than or less than, in the interval case, yes, we can say greater than or less than, but we can also use addition signs and subtraction signs to perform those mathematical operations on interval scale data. We'll now move off to the last and our final scale. This is called the ratio scale, and this is the most precise of all the scales. As we go from nominal to ratio, we're increasing the precision or the subtleness of our measurements. Ratio scales are very much like interval scales in that they have equal step sizes, but they have one additional feature that distinguishes them from the interval scale. And that feature is the feature of having an absolute zero point. And by that we mean that these scales allow us to measure variables for which you can have absolutely none of the quantity, and that would mean zero of the quantity. So let's take a, an example. In fact, we'll develop Further, the example that we had used earlier of the health psychologist that's interested in weight changes. We said a moment ago that we can measure weight in pounds or in kilograms, and the interval between 2 or 4 is the same as between 4 and 6. That's still true over here. But imagine that we have a 2-pound gain in a client of ours who weighs 100 pounds. Imagine instead that we have a 2-pound gain in a different client who weighs 200 pounds. For the first 100-pound client, the 2-pound gain is a 2% increase in weight. For the second client, we now have a 1% increase in weight as that person goes from 200 pounds to 202 pounds. It's the same interval. It's still a 2-pound interval, but those are very different ratios. And they're different ratios because we can measure body weight on a scale that goes, in principle, all the way down to zero, absolutely none of a quantity. So now with the ratio scale, we can begin to introduce division and multiplication, because those are necessary for ratios. By contrast, for the interval scale, we would not do ratios and we would not do multiplication and division, but we could do addition and subtraction, 
over here for ordinal scales we can have greater than or less than signs and for the nominal scales all we can say is equal to or not equal to. Okay, thanks for listening.